Hey everyone, I want to talk today about um, player engagement and the potential of emotionally affecting experiences that go beyond fun. Um, my name is Eileen, I'm a usability engineer and I work for about 11 years in games now as a UX designer. I worked on several games like strategy, multiplayer, RPG, uh, shooter and open world. And now I'm for three years at Ubisoft where I started as UX lead in the project Avatar and work now for Ubisoft HQ. And I believe uh, that games can be enjoyable, but also meaningful, and uh, that we can create experiences that go uh, that bring something good to players' real life. But first, I want to talk about uh, game UX. And for me, it's all about players' engagement, how players behave and think, but much more how they feel and remember the game. And there are three core pillars uh, that are important. Uh, the first one is motivation. That is as the origin of all human behavior. The second one is emotions, which serve motivation in a sense that they help us to choose uh, the right behavior and create meaning for us. And immersion, that is the ability to suspend the real world and become someone else. The focus in game entertainment was for a long time uh, to design pure enjoyment seeking experiences, but all media research had a huge shift over the last years to more complex experiences that allow personal growth and getting a sense of meaning in life. So I want to talk today about how to create meaningful and memorable experiences, but also how to have a positive impact on players real life. So, and for this, uh, if you look at games like The Division, Rocket League, Assassin's Creed, and Mario Kart, these are very different games, um, but they are all designed for an immediate player engagement, and they are mostly free of cognitive conflict, and this is called hedonic uh, UX. Those experiences are based on easy cognitive processing with a clear and simple storyline, and they avoid emotionally disturbing content mostly. The fun to play will derive from positive emotions and the player will feel happy and get a sense of being carefree. And this feeling of enjoyment are short term and usually arrive while playing or immediately after play. But Hedonia UX is uh, only one aspect of game UX. Uh, games can also serve to stimulate rewarding, affective and cognitive experience because they would contribute to our emotional well-being in a more sustainable way. For example, when we create deeply meaningful experience or social connectiveness, it may foster a sense of insight and personal growth. So we can add another level to this and what is uh, called eudaimonic UX. This is building on what we value and envision. And other like uh, hedonia UX, happiness will derive from meaning, insight, uh, relevance, morale, and so on. And this can support a greater long-term well-being and appreciation for the game. When a game is meaningful, it will still linger with players for days or even months later. So it creates a long-term pleasure and memory of the game. It does involve a higher cognitive process uh, and a mix of positive but also negative emotions. And for example, uh, games like Papers, Please, Life is Strange, Last of Us, Walking Dead uh, are very high on eudaimonic UX. Uh, and both together is described by Peter Forderer as a two-factor motivation model, because both experiences are not in conflict, and you can have both fun and a meaningful game. Research also shows that they uh, even complement each other. And players' uh, needs and expectations have uh, changed over the last years, and players want to be engaged in a meaningful way. Games are no longer seen with a only focus on fun, but also as moving and thought-provoking experiences. And the need for meaning seems to be even more important than simply uh, feeling good. But those experiences can also have a positive impact on players' real life. For example, emotional game experience can inspire a player to think about their life uh, or how they perceive themselves. For example, player report, uh, reported that they question themselves in terms of being too selfish uh, after playing the journey. And people are also constantly driven to improve uh, themselves, uh, like the quality of life, uh, the social status, the health, uh, or happiness. And content that allows for self-reflection contributes to emotional st stability and well-being in the long term, because we might learn about ourselves, others, uh, or the environment. So uh, we can also create feelings of interconnectedness um, with us to others. 
it's a meaningful experience, may motivate us to be kinder to others uh, or create empathy and better understanding of others' beliefs and values. And we can reflect on situations from our past uh, from a different angle. We can also encourage processes of cognitive elaboration, attitude change, and information seeking about social and even political issues. For example, a study showed that after viewing a moving uh, film scene about political relevant issue, that people had more reflective thoughts about this issue and spent more time reading news articles um, after you. So we can habitualize uh, our player, uh, for example, to be mindful to nature, political issues, uh, socializing, and even global warming. So I'm gonna talk a little bit how we can create meaning uh, and deeper insight uh, with our games. And in order to design those, we can look at the five dimensions of eudaimonic well-being. This includes on one hand self-determination, what describes human basic psychology needs, and they are fundamental to our motivated behaviors. And this we need are competence, which is our need to experience efficacy and personal growth, and autonomy, the need to feel volitional through meaningful choice and feel in control of our choices uh, and be in harmony with them. And the last one is relatedness, uh, is a need for close emotional bonds, meaningful connections to others, uh, and a sense of belonging. And self-determination is very well known by now. And those needs help us to form a sense of identity. But they won't give uh, meaning, like the activation of central values, purpose in life, or self-acceptance. Those require an additional emotional uh, and cognitive effort and sense-making. So to create a new harmonic experience, we must complement the basic fundamental needs. In the research of Mary Beth Oliver and Co, um, they defined a supplement to self-determination called insight. This is a need to experience a greater understanding of essential values, fundamental beliefs, and even important life lessons. So this is a perception of deeper meaning, the feeling of being moved, uh, and the motivation to elaborate on our thoughts and feelings. They have also found in the study that games with uh, high quality gameplay are associated with greater satisfaction of autonomy and competence, which are associated by player as enjoyment and pleasure seeking experiences. And the satisfaction of relatedness and insight uh, are perceived as appreciation of the game. Research also shows that insight will strongly influence the overall judgment of the game experience. So I'm going to focus on this today and will not go deeper into self-determination. So meaningful in games can be either done by content that is social conscious, uh, content gives a deeper insight to personal relevant uh, values, or lessons learned from morally challenging uh, content. And this would be, for example, morally complex characters, uh, like Last of Us. Uh, all characters have depths and change over time, how they deal with moral decision. And they leave room uh, for the player to reflect on own moral values. But also in multiplayer situation and the way the social relationships are built can be morally challenging. For example, in the uh, if the players are put in a situation to either save a teammate or to play itself um, for themselves, like in DZ often. Then we, of course, have emotionally engaging storylines, um, but we do not necessarily need a deep story. We can also create emotionally engaging uh, game mechanics. For example, in the game Florence, uh, they indicate a relationship falling apart with a simple puzzle. While the player is connecting the pieces, uh, they float away, um, what will indicate how challenging it can be to hold uh, a relationship together in difficult times. Or the game uh, Brothers, you play with both uh, brothers uh, at the same time on the controller. And this deepens the feeling of connectiveness uh, between both. So player literally can feel the bond uh, between, but also the loss when one brother is not there. Another more obvious uh, example are reputation uh, systems. Like in Red Dead Redemption, you have equality on harvestables, uh, depending on how considerate the player was treating animals. And this can habitualize the player in real life uh, too, to understand the treatment of nature has an impact. But games can also have a deeper meaning and life lessons, uh, like uh, Hellblade. The game talks about depression and anxiety. 
And of course, we can also create moral choices, uh, which, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Um, but to summarize first, eudaimonic is when you reach a feeling of purpose in what you're doing. And your choice leads to something lets you think of yourself, uh, others or the world. And I'm gonna go a little bit more concrete, uh, how to create meaning. And there are actually two ingredients I think are necessary. The first one is uh, to create a cognitive uh, effort, and cognitive dissonance in the player. And I know we are told uh, for years to reduce every cognitive effort from the player. And this is true in terms of UI, but to create a meaningful game, we do need to build something the player has to think about or what creates suspense to think about and to be curious about. And cognitive dissonance refers to uh, situations uh, involving cognitive uh, attitudes, ideas, beliefs uh, or behaviors. So that is content that is difficult to process because of its complexity. And the complexity I'm talking about arises from the difficulty of integrating new informations to our existing uh, cognitive schemas. For example, movies like Inceptions are challenging because it includes several interrelated stories, which requires viewers to keep track uh, of multiple plot lines. And there's a dissonance coming from information that are not in, uh, that are inconsistent with our, our intuitive nature. Um, for example, a movie that presents insights uh, that are not in line with the viewer's worldview, or a moral dilemma where the viewer's intuitive moral values are not in line. This leaves the player with thinking and gaining uh, personal growth um, because you might alter your beliefs and behaviors to balance out the dissonance. It is kind of a protection mechanism we have to re reduce the discomfort we feel by dissonance. And the second ingredient is mixed um, effect. Uh, that is a mix of positive, but also negative emotions. And in general, it is uh, correct that we want to avoid negative emotions in games like frustration or boredom. So negative emotions that result from bugs, uh, UI, and so on. But to touch on emotions like fear, anger, sadness in a respectful manner can actually enhance the player's experience and gives players a higher appreciation for the game. So, uh, for game, for example, suspenseful and tragic movies often portray the struggle of a hero in a difficult situation to create uh, empathy in the viewer. But I'm going to show you a few more concrete examples and I'm going to start with cognitive dissonance. So research shows that player had significantly higher levels of appreciation in morally challenging games than in non-morally challenging games. So if you look, for example, at a scenario in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and there's nothing wrong with this, I want to point out. I just wasn't to use it as an example. So there is a point, um, the player has two options. They can either forgive the character's sister, uh, and the result will that she changes her mind and the family is reunited. Or the player can sacrifice her with the result that the mother and the son are relieved because now the world is saved and he's smiling. And you might think uh, the decision to sacrifice her in the eudaimonic experience uh, could, could be a eudaimonic experience as you could reflect on the decision uh, and that would be true. But in this example, the player will have no cognitive conflict actually, because the mother tells the player immediately after that this was the right decision. Uh, you are a hero, you saved the world. Um, and with this, the moral decision is resolved by focusing on the good things directly after. This will balance out the cognitive process from the player immediately. So to summarize, when the story outcome align with player's intuitive moral judgment, so the character is rewarded. Um, so higher levels of um, processing are not required, but may lead to immediate enjoyment because any suspense and cognitive dissonance are re revealed at the happy end. But stories with unhappy endings, for example, um, the, for example, the mother would uh, judge the decision. The player would need a cognitive emotion regulation uh, by themselves to balance it out. And this can make it meaningful and give a stronger memorization um, because player might reflect and feel rewarded in the long term. What then might lead to an emotional stability and sustainable well-being? And I want to point out that uh, also multiple studies show that morale and deeper cognitive conflict will not lower the enjoyment uh, of the game. That is a very common misconception. 
morally challenging content may lead so to higher feelings of appreciation and create deeper emotional feelings, which uh, will lead to a long-term memory of this event. And another example uh, I want to I wanna show you is uh, at my heart. It is about environment and animals in games. And most games create an environment uh, relationship based almost only on taking natural resources. But we could also address real world environmental issues with our games and have an impact on players' behavior. Building empathy to the world and uh, environment can foster players' need to explore and discover the world more as well. Um, but it also develops habits. And there are multiple studies that say spending time in nature, even via, via video, promotes uh, cooperative uh, self-restraining and sustainable behavior. For example, by letting the player use and needs environment, by building systems that guide the player uh, and help to explore the nature, or simply mechanics and 3 see the change based on weather of, uh, or time, uh, time of day, like in Zelda. And the same is also counts uh, for animals. They have become a source of violence uh, in many games. They often have no intrinsic value to player because they are mostly presented as animals and tools to use for crafting or to collect trophies, which can uh, indicate that harming animals for fun is all right. And this is even true for games uh, which players encourage to reflect on moral. In Dragon Age, for example, the characters will approve or disapprove the player's actions, but non-harming, uh, non-aggressive uh, animals is not one of them. But also a lot of games uh, let the player kill all animal types in order to get trophies and achievements, uh, no matter if they're innocent or dangerous as well. And animals uh, often also have become an unlimited source of raw materials and killed animals will just respawn. I think we could revisit some of commonly used mechanics and ask ourselves when we design living environments, uh, what message do we want to give our players? And creating empathy and awareness to nature and animals and incorporating more variety can promote more care and real life too. But it also gives more possibilities uh, for the player to discover and explore the world, uh, what may lead to higher replayability as well. And for, for example, uh, Red Dead Redemption, uh, they have a cost on violence against animals. So excessive violence, like taking a shotgun to a rabbit, will generate a lower market price. Or if the player kills uh, their horse, they will lose Hona, and they gain Hona when increasing the bond with the horse. And I think by allowing the player to act on their own morale, we would also be more inclusive to players who do not want to kill enemies, not even in games. And that brings me to emotions. Uh, recent research shows uh, that the appreciation for emotionally challenging experiences involving difficult scenes was highest amongst all challenge types in games. But when we talk about deep emotions uh, or negative emotions, we need to first answer the question, why do we enjoy them? Why do we enjoy tragedies, horror sequences, uh, or thought-provoking movies? And they are also purely fun and uh, comedies uh, available. And games uh, create a high real experience for player. So that emotions like anger, disgust, um, fear, and guilt can be enjoyed as an eudaimonic experience because player can explore different feelings, but is not facing real life consequences of it. So games allow us to confront real issues by experiencing those feelings in a safe distance. And this can help player to overcome unresolved traumas or let them get a different perspective on situations they face in real life. But players do also appreciate and enjoy the experience of strong emotions in itself, even negative violenced emotions. So such negative emotions can contribute to emotional stability and well-being because they can result in positive emotions long term. You might be sad in a moment of watching, uh, but you leave with a feeling of being moved uh, touched and tender-hearted afterwards. So such experiences are characterized as meaningful and typically involve moral emotions such as empathy, elation, or awe. And I think Game of Thrones uh, here is a perfect example uh, for this, 
they pretty much always end up with very negative events. And it works so well because they have an amazing concept of emotional and cognitive dissonance. But another example uh, is Shadow of Colossus. The player feels success by killing the first boss and they will get positive feedback about this. But then the music is drastically changing and the player appears to be killed. And the co uh, conflicting feedback in this case leaves the player feeling bad uh, having killed the Colossus or rethinking this, which is uh, starting a process, a process of emotion regulation. But also a lot of fairy tales and stories for kids include tons of moral lectures and negative emotions. So I think we do not uh, need to be afraid of using them in games either. Uh, just think about Hansel and Gretel or Disney movies like Bambi. Children learn uh, lessons from this and enjoy this kind of stories and remember for years on those stories. And if you want our player to remember our games the same way, we need to make them think and feel something. And the feeling uh, of sadness, I want to talk a little bit more about, um, but it's not by far not the only emotion we should think about. Um, but this is one of the most prominent emotions and the enjoyment and appreciation for these feelings scores pretty high. So sadness felt um, in entertainment, or it's also called uh, empathic sadness. Uh, you might uh, be moved uh, to tears or feel overwhelmed by emotions for in-game characters. For instance, um, Mary, uh, many players reported uh, the loss in Last of Us 1 was so heartbreaking because uh, they got to know the little family before a little bit. And character attachment is, uh, I think, a crucial factor for an eudaimonic experience because when players care about uh, characters in game, they build up empathy or sympathy and they uh, will also have strong feelings for the journey of the character. So when something bad happens uh, to the character, player will feel sad or they feel, uh, they feel happy and relieved if something good happens. So, but the experience of an in-game loss can inspire players to think about themselves uh, and even teach a life lesson. But also the risk of a loss can make players evaluate every decision extremely cautious in the game. And players uh, admire to feel this and empathize with the game character to be emotionally engaged with them. Some players explicitly reported that they linked the experience of simply um, being overwhelmed by strong emotions. But when players uh, have strong emotions, they also like to share those uh, uh, with others outside of the game. So to summarize, um, eudaimonic experience arises from the combination of cognitive and affective challenges. And when we combine those with hedonia and fulfilling intrinsic needs, we can create memorable experiences long term. And we want, when we want our players to have a strong emotion uh, and memory in, our, uh, in the game experience, we have to make them think and feel something. And especially games uh, have such a huge audience, I think we should include more meaning and have a positive impact on players' real life. So that's it from me today. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions or if you wanna share your thoughts. Uh, you are muted, Celia. <laughs> Am I? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not completely awake, to be fair. Uh, yeah, so it was a, an amazing talk. Uh, I saw a lot of people commenting in the chat. <laughs> uh, so that definitely uh, created some reactions. I didn't see the questions, though. Do we have questions for you? It was a very compact uh, talk. <laughs> So yeah, but process. very rich, very interesting. Yes. All right. Thank yeah. you very much for all the comments. Yeah. Yeah, no, people were uh, pretty uh, engaged. Uh, so I have a question from Irem. Uh, how much is a UX researcher involved in this kind of design decision that relate to this hedonic and eudonomic <laughs> experiences during game development? I think uh, a huge role. We always need to test um, everything we do in design. The same counts also for the meaningful impact, the emotions the player feel, the journey, the experience. And I think uh, user research should definitely be involved. Yes. Uh, 
if we want to learn more about this, uh, are there any resources or books you can suggest? Oh, <laughs> I don't know any books, um, but because it's also a fairly new topic for, for games, it's a, a very research topic in uh, movies a lot, and there are some studies out um, in, in the internet you can find, but um, there's not that many studies yet uh, available for, for games, um, but I'm not aware of any books. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? Because I'm <laughs> typing yes. something at the same time. Um, there's um, there's a book that I can recommend. There's uh, Catherine Isbister's uh, book, How Games Move Us, uh, Emotion mm -hmm. by Design. I'm just trying to get the link. Um, I think forgetting the Amazon link. It's not. Uh, so I'm going to share that in the cool. chat. Awesome. Yes, if you uh, have any book recommendations, I'm, I'm also happy to, to see in the chat. And uh, Irene is saying, uh, I would like to clarify my question. In the industry, is it common? I would love to work on this, but I wonder if all companies are open to it. I mean, uh, of course, uh, I, I can't talk for every company, but of course, um, management should be on, on the side for this to, to let everyone invest in it. Uh, and look to further. Um, I believe that uh, every game can have a mix of hedonic and eudaimonic uh, experiences, and you do not necessarily have to decide for either way um, because they co really complement each other. So you can have pockets of both um, in every game, I think. But it depends on, on the game and your vision of the game. If you want to lead more towards a strong eudaimonic experience or if you want to lead more towards hedonic and mix a little bit. That's really up to the vision of the game. But I hope uh, that it will be more and more in the future. Thank you. So some people are asking for the links of their research uh, studies that you're talking about, and also asking, mm -hmm. asking for the slides as well. Uh, so I'll let you deal with the slides if you want to publish them somewhere. Um, it is recorded, and when yeah. I post the video, I will I'm so Aline, if you can give me the links, I will put the links mm -hmm. in the description. And I, I think I, you cannot, uh, there's another question, but I don't think we have the time to answer live. But if you want to answer, um, there are a few questions. Well, a bunch of questions are popping now. Uh, so if you could be so kind to, uh, if you have the time to answer those questions. Yes, uh, I have a look. Via I chat. Um, all right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so, so much again for <laughs> this wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, now we're going to move on to the next topic. I need to stop things here. I have too many screens all over the place. No wonder I forget to unmute all the time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here, Aline. <laughs>